Uh, so last time we briefly introduced graphs, and I gave a very, very brief overview of breadth-first search. Um, but it wasn't super useful because, uh, you know, we talked about the concept of what breadth-first search is at a very abstract level. But we didn't really talk about how you would code that up. So with task nine, your task is to uh, really twofold. One, you want to take all this movie data and build a graph with it. And that graph, I, I think I said it last time, I, I'm being pretty upfront about this one. The, the graph, the intent is for each node to be an actor, and two actors or two nodes being connected if they've been in a movie together. So that's the graph you want to build by adding all the edges based on your movie data. And then you want to find the distance in that graph between two actors. The distance in that graph, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the distance in that graph is exactly the degrees of separation between two actors. We haven't introduced distance yet, so I got a little ahead of it there. But that's your, your goal. So we want to figure out what distance is, and then how to find the distance between two actors, and how to actually code this stuff up. Uh, so let's talk about it. Pass we introduced briefly last time. Let's give a little more detail on this. So a path in a graph is a sequence of nodes or a sequence of edges. You can think of it as a sequence of edges, like, the, like Paul's wording in the lecture question does. And the distance of that path, or the distance, the length of that path, not the distance, but the length of that path is the number of edges in the path or the number of nodes minus one. Each, each of those is going to give you the same number. So Lincoln, the MIT, the Utah, SDC, RAND, UCSB, SRI, this is a valid path because each consecutive pair of nodes is connected by an edge. And the length of that path is six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we have a path of length six in this graph connecting these nodes. Distance is the length of the shortest path between two nodes. So if you find a shortest path between two nodes, the length of that path is the distance between those two nodes. And for your homework, distance is, as long as you set your graph up properly, distance in that graph is exactly the degrees of separation between two actors. So that's what we want to do is compute distance. So distance is the length of a shortest path between two nodes. Oh, even my slides do it. But uh, it's a shortest path because there might be multiple shortest paths between case and BBN, the distance is two, or sorry, the distance is three. The distance is three, I can find a path of length three connecting them, one, two, three. And I can actually find two of them, one, two, three. We have two paths that are the A shortest path between these two nodes. So their distance is three because as hard as I try, I'm never gonna find a path of distance, uh, a path of length two connecting those two nodes just doesn't exist in this graph. So the distance is three. Lincoln SRI, same thing. Lincoln to SRI, we found that path that meanders around the graph of length seven, but there is a path of length three connecting the two nodes. One, two, three. So we can take this path to get there. So the shortest path is three because I can never find a path of length two connecting those two edges. And if two nodes are connected by an edge directly, their distance is going to be one. You just traverse that edge. And if a node, the distance between a node and itself, the distance between SDC and SDC is zero. You don't have to traverse any edges. The shortest path from a node to itself is just that node. Number of edges is zero. Number of nodes minus one is zero. So distance zero, a node to itself. Uh, so degrees of separation, an actor to themselves, zero degrees of separation. If they've been in a movie together, that's one. And if they haven't been in a movie together, it's the number of actors you'd have to go through to be able to get from one actor to another, uh, following all of the connections based on have these two actors been in a movie together. So that's what our goal, is to compute this distance in, uh, in task nine. We're gonna use breadth first search to do that. So breadth first search actually gives us a lot of useful information that will help us compute distance, which we're doing in task nine, and even do pathfinding, which used to be required of the course. Maybe someday it will be again, but it was going to be part of task nine, but 
I don't know, it, it, it's a bit much. Uh, Y'all have been through enough at this point in the semester. We're exhausted. Uh, let's not do pass. But I'll still cover it in the slides, explain how pathfinding would work if uh, you were required to do it. Uh, the, the reason pathfinding is cut, there's only really one reason why. It's uh, because of the multiple pass thing, there are multiple shortest paths. So if I say write a method that returns a shortest path, your testing becomes pretty difficult because you have to accept any of the valid shortest paths as correct. Which, as you know from doing the read songs, where the songs can be returned in any order, uh, it makes testing more tedious when there are multiple correct answers. That's good practice. I want you to go through that every once in a while, but I don't have to hit you on every assignment with something like that. So test nine isn't going to hit you with that one. Test seven does with the songs being able to be in any order uh, in the return value of the return songs. And for those of you going through it, for those of you wondering, uh, the read movies is the same way. The order doesn't matter, but my correct solution just happens to return it in the order of the file. So you get away with it on movies, but songs are where you're really getting the practice of, okay, this data structure, I want to check if it has all the right information, but it can be in the any order. Uh, so read songs is really giving you practice with that one. Okay, so how are we going to use breadth first search? I got a little sidetracked there. Uh, how are we going to use breadth first search to find the distance between two nodes? Okay, so let's run through breadth first search again. We're going to run through breadth first search three times today. We already ran through it once on Monday. So we're going to get a lot of practice looking at breadth first search. So with breadth first search, we're going to run it. But I'm going to keep track of the edges that we've used during our run of breadth first search. And I'm going to choose Carnegie as our starting node this time because I keep getting sick of doing UCLA. I feel like I, I always start at that one just because it's at the top. So we're going to switch it to Carnegie to get a little more interesting graph out of this thing. So with Carnegie as a start node, what we're going to do is draw our nodes as they're explored over to the side here. And each time a node explores a new node, as soon as it discovers a new node, we're going to draw it over here, visually lower. Our new nodes that are discovered are going to go down. Uh, this this uh, diagram, it's going to be a graph, but uh, down this graph. And we're going to keep track of only the edges that we used during breadth first search. So Carnegie explores Case and Harvard. So we're going to add those nodes to our data structure and have them go down visually in our diagram here. Case and BBN, or sorry, Case and Harvard are going to explore Lincoln and BBN. So from Case, we explored Lincoln. From Harvard, we explored BBN. So we're going to draw those edges as we're exploring now the neighbors of the neighbors of the starting node. So we explored the starting node, explored its neighbors, explored the neighbors of the neighbors. Now we're going to the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors. Uh, we're going to keep going through this algorithm, keeping track of the edges we used. And we're about to hit a little bit of ambiguity. Lincoln and BBN, either one of them could discover MIT. Which one discovers it isn't going to matter for our purposes, I'll say. Uh, these ties can be broken arbitrarily. So I'm just going to pick one of them. I'm going to choose Lincoln to discover MIT. And BBN is going to discover RAND. There's no, um, there's no ambiguity there. So I could easily have BBN discover MIT and have MIT over here off of BBN instead of off of Lincoln. Lincoln wouldn't have any nodes down here. But I'm importantly only going to choose one of them. Uh, it's only when the node is first discovered, or else BBN would have Harvard right here, uh, and we'd have that issue we talked about on Monday of going infinite and blowing up when we're traversing around these cycles in the graph. We have a cycle right here. We would traverse this cycle forever. Uh, so we're only exploring a node one time. And Lincoln happened to be the one that explored MIT. I chose that one because it looks a little better on the slide. Is the only reason. Uh, Lincoln discovering MIT makes this a little more balanced, or else everything would be off of BBN for the rest of the graph. Then MIT is going to discover Utah. RAND is going to discover three separate nodes. So we're going to add those to our graph, again, visually lower than the node that it was discovered by. Utah is going to discover SRI, and UCLA is going to discover Stanford. 
So we did the same thing we did last time. We're exploring the neighbors, the neighbors, the neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. Except this time we're storing the data of each edge that we used to discover a new node, and each edge is going to get, bring us visually lower on this uh, graph that we're building. And we're left with a graph which is equivalent to the initial graph, it, uh, just rearranged visually, but it has the same nodes but it doesn't have all the same edges. We just removed any edges that weren't used during our breath first search run. So we have some of these edges that just weren't used during that execution. So this is what we're left with, and this graph is a tree. Now it's not a tree, it's not like our binary trees that we used. Um, it is the, a theoretical tree. It is still a graph, we're representing it as a graph here, but it is a tree in the sense that it has no cycles. So we have a graph that is a tree, and this is our breath, we can call this our breath first search tree. These are all the edges we use during breath first search, and guess what? It's got levels. So when we draw this visually, where each edge goes down visually, and then we separate each group of nodes based on what level they were discovered in, where this is the starting node, then the neighbors of the starting node, the neighbors of the neighbors, etc. We can label these levels in this tree, and the level number is exactly the distance from the starting node to that node. And this is where we get a lot of good information out of our breath first search run. So if a node, say Rand, is on level three, that means its distance, the distance from Carnegie to Rand is three. So when we run breadth first search, the information we can get is the distance from the starting node to every other node in the graph. So the starting node to itself is level zero, distance zero to the starting node. Its neighbors are all distance one. The neighbors of the neighbors are gonna be distance two. And suppose, like BBN, how do we know that it's distance two? Well, I'm telling you breath first search tells us that. But if BBN was not distance two, say it was distance one, meaning it should be in level one, well, for it to be in level one, there would have had to been an edge connecting Carnegie and BBN for it to be in level one. So the fact that Carnegie didn't discover BBN and put it in level one means that there is no edge between Carnegie and BBN. We know that for a fact. And we can extend that to each of our levels. Level three, well, if it were in level two, it would have been discovered by one of the neighbors of the neighbors of the starting node. Since it wasn't, there must not be a path of length two that exists between Carnegie and Rand. And all the way to SRI and Stanford, you can try all day looking at that graph. You're never gonna find a path from between Carnegie and SRI or Carnegie and Stanford that's shorter than distance five, or it's shorter than length five. Now we're gonna find a shorter path because its distance is five, meaning there is no shorter path than five connecting those two nodes. Will there be memory diagrams on next week's quiz? Yeah, every single quiz is memory diagrams. Every single one of them. Uh, Friday's gonna be a memory diagram in the slides to give you, get you warmed up to that one a little bit. Um, but I, I said it before, I don't know if I said it in this lecture, but uh, we could give you the graphs quiz right now and you'd be, I would expect you to be able to do the graphs quiz right now, uh, last Friday even, before you even knew what a graph was, you should be able to do the graphs quiz because there's no new concepts in terms of the memory diagram. There's no new concepts we're teaching. It's using hash maps and array lists and constructors. It's all stuff you've done before. I'll still do a memory diagram on Friday just to you know, make sure we're all on the same page with that one and give you a little more practice, a little more uh, something to study off of and everything. But you should be able to do the graph quiz right now. Uh, if, you, if you can't, then there's, there's a problem somewhere else. That means you probably shouldn't have passed one of the previous quizzes, if, if I'm being honest. Because uh, it's hash maps, array lists, constructors, um, method calls. It's all stuff we've done before. It's just a new way of combining those things. Um, but to do the memory diagram, you don't really need to understand what a graph is or how a graph works or, or any of that. Uh, you just have to understand all the concepts we've learned so far. So I wouldn't sweat. If, as long as you're keeping up on stuff and you, you're 
tracking with what's happening in this course, I wouldn't sweat the quiz next week at all. Um, uh, the interview, you will have to understand graphs and stuff. Test nine, you have to understand breadth first search and how to implement it and everything. Uh, but the, the quiz should be the easiest part of this, this round, this week of content. Okay, so this is all great. We can, we can do levels and stuff and get distance numbers out of these things. But how the hell do we code this up? So multiple times, like constantly throughout the run of this, I said, draw the node visually lower. Make sure the edges go down on the slide or something. How do you code that? How am I going to write code that says, add this node but make it go down visually? Uh, we really can't do that. I mean, technically you could, but that's far beyond anything that we're going to talk about in probably your whole four years here. Uh, maybe an AI course will get into that. Some uh, visual representation, not visual representation, but visual uh, uh, computer vision. So you'd have to represent it visually and then have the computer read the visual. That's really hard stuff to do. Um, we're not going to do that. So we can't really rely on visuals. So how about data structures? We're familiar with data structures. We know how data structures work. So let's use data structures to keep track of the same information we just did with the levels and the visuals and everything, but let's represent it in a way that the computer is going to be able to understand and that we can train a computer to do instead of visually, which is good for us humans, but really bad for computers, really hard to code for computers. So let's use some data structures for this thing. And this is where I'll walk through all the implementation details of how Breath First Search works. We went through Breath First Search twice in the slides already, but I really didn't give any details of how you're expected to code that. Uh, so here's where uh, I won't show you any code for Breath First Search. Uh, you have all the code we're going to show you for this week's content. It's in the examples repo. It's pretty much what I showed last time. Uh, and then a couple of methods that honestly won't be too helpful for, um, for task nine. But, uh, but you're expected to code up the rest of it, how to use that graph and how to run Breath First Search. That said, I'm going to walk you through exactly what, how I expect you to build that. I'm going to tell you all the details, what you should do in your code. I'm basically going to, basically going to spell out how your code should work, like how you should write your code. Uh, and then you're expected to take this explanation and then actually code it up. Uh, so it's very much a an exercise in taking the explanation of an algorithm, even with, actually, I, I'm given implementation details, so not even just the explanation of an algorithm, but an explanation of an algorithm plus implementation details, and then actually turning it into code. That's what you're expected to do for this one. Uh, that said, this one has given, historically, students trouble in the past. I'm not positive why. I, I feel like it's fairly straightforward. So if at any point you can see why it's not straightforward, I want your questions. Let me know your questions, because uh, I, I don't know exactly where students get hung up on this, uh, on this one. Uh, I, I think, uh, so usually this is a few weeks later in the semester. My, my biz, biggest guess is to, just everyone's burnt out by then, by the time we get to this one, that, uh, that it's really hard to just get through one more assignment. How would you find the distance from case to BBN using levels? You would, so if you want to find the distance between any two arbitrary nodes, case and BBN in this case. You would choose one of them as your starting node. I'll choose case, choose case as your starting node, run breadth first search, and then look at the level of BBN, and it's going to be its distance. So if, uh, so we just chose Carnegie. So for example, if our task was to find the distance between Carnegie and SRI, then we'd choose one of them as a starting node, run breadth first search, and then look up the distance for SRI. That's going to be our, our approach here. Uh, running breath first search one time is only going to find you the distance from the starting node to every node. So if you need the distance between two nodes and neither of them are your starting node, you've got to rerun breath first search. Three data structures, to be exact. Three data structures we're going to use here. Uh, this is my recommended way to, to implement this. And let's talk about what those three are. First, a queue. This is going to keep track of the order in which we're going to visit nodes. These are all the nodes that we're going to visit, or more specifically, the nodes we're going to visit the neighbors of. And the queue is going to do a lot of work in the ordering here. The queue is going to keep track of how, what order we're going to visit the nodes in a way that we don't really have to think about it. 
as long as we use a queue, the queue does a lot of the heavy lifting and making sure that we do things in the right order. Uh, for the queue, we've covered a queue, uh, we covered queues in class already. Uh, you have a queue implementation in the repo if you want to use that implementation of a queue with in queue and DQ. Knock yourself out, go for that, grab that code out of the repo. Anything that I show, any code I show in class, any code in the examples repo, all of that's fair game to use in your homework. That's the only code that you're allowed to just cut and paste into your project uh, is code that you got from this course, from me, from Paul, from the examples repos, from the uh, Paul's repos of the live code he does in lecture. Any of that code you can use in your projects. I, I feel like I haven't mentioned that in lecture, so I'm making sure I mention it in all three lectures today. Um, or Java has a built-in queue. If you want to use Java's queue class, feel free to use that as well. Study up the documentation, learn how it works, and, and use that one. You're welcome to do that as well if you want to figure out how to use that one. But some form of queue. Then we're going to need some data structure, which I'm going to represent as orange highlighted nodes in my graph. Some data structure to keep track of which nodes have been explored. I'm using the, the uh, interface names here, but, uh, but a linked list, an array list, a hash set, a tree set, any of these things would be fine, or a binary search tree even. I, I don't care what you use. But some data structure that's going to keep track of what nodes have been visited. So uh, the, node, the data structure that really should be used here in terms of efficiency is a hash set in Java, which implements the set interface. Uh, that's the one that probably should be used for efficiency, but this isn't 250. I'm not going to grade you on efficiency, uh, not to any great degree. I, I, maybe I should mention this, but uh, not to any great degree, but that would be the most efficient one. But if everybody uses an array list, which more or so what I expect from most of you. They'll just use an array list for this and array list that contains. Uh, that's more so what I would expect. But a set, uh, if you want to use a set, sets in Java or in most languages work just like the sets you're learning about in 191. It's a data structure where you can add elements into it and you can check if an element exists in it and it won't allow duplicates. You can't have any duplicates in your, uh, in your hash set in Java. It's very efficient. It gives you, I believe, O of 1. should be O of 1. Um, insert O of 1 dot contains, O of 1 delete, but we wouldn't be deleting in this context. Uh, gives you optimal runtime for all your operations. Very, very fast. Where your array list is going to be O of N for a lot of your operations. But for what we're doing, O of N you'll get away with. Uh, I say I won't grade you on efficiency, but there is one case where I will, where uh, task nine is graded on efficiency, is if you decide, I'm not using breadth first search at all. I'm just going to brute force the hell out of this thing and just check every possible path. Like, if you do something silly like that, you're going to time out in Autolab. Uh, you have to actually use breadth first search. If, because uh, if you check every possible path that exists and then take the min of those, uh, and have, I believe it'd be an n factorial runtime, uh, that's not gonna, it's just not gonna do it for you. Uh, so some data structure to keep track of which nodes have been explored. And then our third data structure, the one I haven't mentioned at all yet, and the one that's gonna get rid of our draw it lower visually thing, is some map interface, hash map that we've been using all semester that's going to store the distance from the starting node to any other node in the graph. So for each node, what's its distance from the starting node? And you can either initialize all the nodes to some default value, infinity uh, in the slide, but these will be ints, so probably negative one would be your indicator for two nodes are not connected. Or just don't add them into the hash map at all. If the key for a node doesn't exist, you can assume that it hasn't been explored. Uh, that's fine, too. Uh, but however you want to represent this node's distance from the starting node is this. And then we're going to initialize all three data structures with our starting node. This is going to give our starting point for the algorithm. We're going to mark the starting node as explored, so we're going to add it to whatever data structure. I, I prefer a set, but we're going to add that to our set to say this node has been explored. We're going to enqueue it into our queue to say this node's neighbors need to be explored whenever it gets to the front of the queue, which it is already at this point. 
and the distance from the starting node to itself is zero. So we're going to hard code that. The distance from the starting node to the starting node, that's zero. We don't have to traverse any edges to get from a node to itself. And then we're ready to fire up the algorithm. So we're creating three data structures. We're initializing them with the information for the starting node. And then what we're going to do is loop until this queue is empty, which I, I slipped on the, the other lecture. It's not a bad slip or anything, but you should be thinking while loop for that. We want to loop while there's something left in the queue. We want to keep looping. So every time we loop, we're going to dequeue from the queue and then visit all of the neighbors of that node. So we're going to dequeue Carnegie eventually. We're going to dequeue Carnegie and then visit all of its neighbors. For this, we're going to look up our adjacency list. The adjacency list directly tells you the neighbors of a node. We're going to say, hey, adjacency list, give me all the neighbors for Carnegie. You're going to loop over all those neighbors, and you're going to do, uh, you're going to check one thing. You're going to say for each neighbor, and the way I, code, I built this case is going to be uh, checked first. For each neighbor, we're going to check one thing. Has this node been explored yet? So visually, is it orange, or in your code, is it in my data structure that's keeping track of which nodes have been explored? So is it in my set? Is it in my array list, if you're using an array list? It's not, so we're going to do three things. Whenever we find a node that hasn't been explored yet, we do three things. One, mark it as explored. We're about to explore it. Mark it as explored, so we're going to add it to our data structure that's keeping track of which nodes are explored, which again are all the nodes in orange here are the ones that are in my explored data structure. Two, we're going to enqueue it. And three, we're going to uh, add the distance to our distance. We're going to update its distance in the distance hash map. To compute the distance of a node, you're going to take the distance of the node that discovered it. You're going to look that up in the hash map. In this case, zero, we're still at the starting node. Whatever node we're, we're exploring the neighbors of, get the distance of that node and add one. That's the distance of the node you just discovered. So if I can get to a node with a certain amount of distance, that means that node's distance, the shortest path from the starting node to that node, is that distance that we have in this, uh, in this hash map. And if we're exploring a brand new node from that node, its distance must be whatever the node that explored its distance is plus one, because we have one extra edge to get to that new node. And that's really it. I'll run through the entire algorithm here, but really that's it. Those are all of your implementation details. You're going to keep doing that in a loop until your queue is empty. Those are the checks that you're going to do. Those are all the things all the stuff. So Carnegie also discovers Harvard. Harvard was not explored yet, so we're going to mark it as explored, enqueue it, and set its distance equal to the distance of the node that discovered it, which is zero in this case, plus one. And we go back to our queue. So we, we dequeued Carnegie. We processed all of its neighbors, and now we're ready to go back to the queue, which is the back at the beginning of our loop. The queue is not empty, so we're going to dequeue case. Case is going to check Car all of its neighbors. It's going to check Carnegie. Carnegie's already explored, so we're going to say, hey, explore data structure. Has Carnegie been explored yet? That data structure is going to be like, yeah, Carnegie's already in here. It's already been explored. So what we do is nothing. We don't do anything. Node's already been explored. The whole point of checking if a node's been explored or not yet is to avoid going infinitely around cycles or infinitely back and forth like this, getting caught in a cycle in a graph. We're avoiding all that by checking if a node has been explored. That's what's avoiding us, uh, preventing us from going infinite. So we check if the node's been explored, Carnegie's been explored, do nothing. Lincoln has not been explored, so we're going to mark it as explored. We're going to enqueue it, and we're going to set Lincoln's distance 
to the distance of case plus one. So if we can get from the starting node, and notice we're not going back to Carnegie at all. If we can get from the starting node, Carnegie, to case in a path of length one, and case is discovering Lincoln for the first time, then the distance from the starting node to Lincoln must be two. Because it's whatever, however long it takes to get to case, plus this one extra edge that it takes to get from case to Lincoln. Then we go back to our queue. Same thing with Harvard. We're going to check Carnegie. It's already been visited, so we do nothing. We're going to check BBN. It has not been explored, so we mark it as explored, enqueue it, and set its distance equal to Harvard's distance plus one. And here's where we see how the tie is broken arbitrarily. Lincoln and BBN are kind of fighting over MIT. And whoever gets it is whoever's first in the queue. So when I say ties are broken arbitrarily, I don't mean that you're going to break those ties arbitrarily. I just mean that they're going to be broken arbitrarily. Uh, so you don't, won't have any lines of code, nothing in your code that's going to say uh, this, OK, when two nodes can find the same node, this, this is how we're going to decide we're going to do Math, if math.rand less than 0 0.5, it's this node. Otherwise, it's this node. We're not going to do any of that stuff. You don't have to do anything. What determines what edge is used and how this tie is broken is the order of the nodes of neighbors in the adjacency list, which is decided by what order you added the edges in when you created the graph, which is, so I guess, you know, uh, that's when the, the tie is broken arbitrarily. So I guess in some way you have control over it, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. We're going to get the same distance number. Whether Lincoln discovers MIT or BBN discovers MIT, MIT is going to have distance three no matter what. doesn't matter because BBN and Lincoln both have distance two. And whenever you have an arbitrary tie like this, that is always going to be the case both, all nodes that can discover a node are going to have the same distance. So no matter which one we have, which one finds it, which one explores MIT, we're going to get the same distance of three for MIT. So it's not going to matter for our purposes. And what made the difference here was the order in the adjacency list for Carnegie. I said, you know, I was making the slide, so I just, I did have to break this arbitrarily. But I decided that Case was before Harvard in Carnegie's array list. So Case was explored first. Case made it into the queue before Harvard, which meant Lincoln made it into the queue before BBN. And then Lincoln is going to be dequeued and find MIT before BBN has a chance to get there. So that's how the arbitrary tie is broken. It's just the order of the edges in the adjacency list. And that's all. And it doesn't matter for our purposes. We will get a slightly different path. So Lincoln's going to check case, already explored, check MIT, not explored, mark it as explored, add it to the queue, set its distance equal to Lincoln's distance plus one. So if we're checking the path, we do get a different path. We get this path instead of this path. So if that happens to make a difference for your whatever application you're using, then you want to be more careful about how ties are broken. For our purposes, that's not going to make a difference. BBN is going to try to explore Harvard. It's already explored. Don't do anything. Try to explore MIT. It's already explored. Don't do anything. Because it was just explored, so this edge isn't going to be used. And then Rand, explore it, add it to the queue, set its distance equal to BBN's distance, plus one. MIT, Lincoln, and BBN, already explored. Don't do anything. Utah, mark it as explored, enqueue it, and add it at its distance to the hash map with MIT's distance plus one. Rand is going to find three new nodes, so check BBN, nothing to do there. SDC, UCSB, and UCLA, those are all going to be marked as explored, added to the queue, enqueued into the queue and update their distance to be four, Rand's distance plus one. 
And now notice what the queue is doing for us. I said the queue takes care of the ordering for us. The way the queue is keeping track of that, the, the way the feature that we get from this is that every node of a certain distance is going to be explored before any node of the next distance. So for the starting node, we added the starting node of distance zero. It's the only node with distance zero, so it's going to be explored before any other node in the graph, of course, because that's the one we enqueued first. And then it's going to enqueue every node of distance one. So every node of distance one made it into the queue before any other node except the starting node. And then as we're exploring these nodes, they're adding nodes of distance two, but we're going to explore every node of distance one before any node of distance two. We're going to explore every node of distance two before any node of distance three. And we just got done exploring all of the nodes of distance three. We just did RAND was the last one, but we did all of these nodes of all, both of these nodes with distance three before we touched any node of distance four. We're right now at a point where the front of the queue is a node of distance four, and we can only get there, what the queue gives us, the property it gives us, is we only get a node with distance four at the front of the queue if we've already seen all of the nodes of distance three. We've already dequeued every node of distance three. And then we're gonna visit all of the nodes of distance four before we check any node of distance five, likewise. Uh, and it's very important that we visit these nodes in this order. So, for example, if we had this node of distance four and a node of distance, um, that's one that makes sense, Utah and Rand. So, say we visited Utah before Rand, and Utah was the one to discover SDC, and we're saying, okay, Utah discovered SDC, so therefore SDC has Utah's distance plus one, SDC has a distance of five then. And then when Rand goes to explore SDC, it's going to say, oh, SDC's already explored, and skip it, even though Rand would have found a shorter path from Carnegie to SDC than going through this path of length five. We want to find this path of length four. And the queue guarantees that we will find that path of length four because Rand must be explored before Utah. It must be in the queue before Utah because it has lower distance. So as long as we code everything right, breadth first search and the queue is going to guarantee that ordering, which is the ordering we need. So now let's explore all the nodes of length four, or of distance four, Utah, MIT already explored, SDC already explored, SRI is brand new, add it, enqueue it, mark it as explored, distance five, Utah's distance is four, plus one, gives us our five, UCLA, already explored, already explored, already explored, but does find Stanford. Mark Stanford is explored, and queue it. And Stanford's distance is also five, UCLA's distance plus one. DQ UCSB, nothing to do. DQ SDC, nothing to, uh, nothing to do. DQ SRI, nothing to do. DQ Stanford, nothing to do. And finally, our queue is empty. Once the queue is empty, we're done. We're out of here. There's nothing else, else to do. And our distance map, our hash map of distances here, is the distance from Stanford to all of these nodes, which we did without relying on visuals or anything. We used three data structures, a queue, a preferably hash set, but array list is fine, and a hash map to keep track of all the information we need to keep track of. And now we have all of the distances from Stanford to any node, and you can try it all day. You're never gonna find a path from Stanford to any of these nodes that's less than, that has length less than any of these numbers. SRI, try going SRI to Carnegie less than five. Uh, I can follow the yellow edges, one, two, three, four, five, and find my path of length five. I'm never gonna find a shorter one. I can tie it, remember we had this arbitrary decision with MIT, one, two, three, four, five. We can tie it there. There's multiple shortest paths, that's fine. You're never gonna find a path shorter. No way we can get through this graph with a shorter path.
So that's what you're expected to do with task nine. Take all the movies, build the graph where nodes are the actors and their connect nodes are connected by an edge if two actors have been in a movie together. And then run breath first search with these three data structures, get all of your distance information, run breath first search with one of the, when you have your degrees of separation, you have two actors, choose one as your starting node, run breath first search. That gives you the distance from the starting node to all other nodes or the degrees of separation from one actor to all other actors. And then look up the other one, the one that's not your starting node, look it up in your hash map. If it's there, return that value. If it's not, negative one. That's what you're expected to do on test nine. I don't know if I can spell it out too much more than that before I start writing code for you. But are there any questions? Is that clear enough? Or anything that I can explain more, better, again? No questions in chat. If not, I want to talk about pathfinding. So you're not required to do it this semester, but I still want to talk about it because it's a fun topic, I think, anyway. Hope you agree. But uh, we want to be able to find a path in this graph. So instead of just finding the distance from uh, between two nodes, what if I want to find the actual path? What if I want to do some pathfinding? Instead of just saying, oh, yeah, these two actors, the degrees of separation is three, I want to actually say, oh, they're connected through this actor in this movie and this actor in this movie. That's how they're actually connected. What if I want to print that out? Which was going to be part of task nine, um, but uh, uh, but it was cut at the last second, I guess, uh, which I hope hopefully you're thankful for. Uh, you're welcome to do that optionally if you want to. You don't have to be forced to do it to do it, but nobody's forced to do it. Uh, but I still want to explain how to do it. So instead of tracking the distances and initializing the starting node as distance zero. We're going to have some way to mark the starting node as the start node. So some special character in your code, null maybe would be fine, it would be a fine choice, uh, to mark the starting node as the starting node. And then as we go through breadth first search, instead of keeping track of each node's distance, we keep track of the node that found it. What node discovered it? So Harvard was discovered by Carnegie. So Harvard was discovered by Carnegie. Case was discovered by Carnegie. BBN was discovered by Harvard. MIT was discovered by Lincoln, we decided. Could have been BBN, would have been just fine. And keep track of that throughout the whole runtime of the algorithm. So don't keep track of just the distance, but keep track of the node that discovered it. And then when we want to find our path, we're going to work backwards. So say we want to find the path from Carnegie to Stanford. We're going to start at the target, start at the end point, and ask each node, who found you? So we're going to ask Stanford, who found you? Stanford is going to be the end of our path. We know that's our destination. And then we're going to ask Stanford, who found you? Well, UCLA did. So UCLA is our second to last node. UCLA, who found you? Well, Rand found me. So Rand is our next node. Rand, who found you? BBN found me. Add that node. BBN, who found you? Harvard found me. Harvard, who found you? Carnegie. Carnegie, who found you? Yo, I'm the starting node. Once we get to the starting node, we have our path. And that's our A shortest path, not necessarily the, I think it is the shortest path in this example, but it's A shortest path from the starting node to whatever node we want. We work our way backwards from our destination and then find our shortest path. Uh, in three weeks, oh, yeah, it is three weeks. We got four weeks left in the semester, four and a half, I guess. Uh, in three weeks, we'll we'll talk about weighted graphs, and uh, where each edge can have a certain weight associated with it. Uh, for example, if you wanted driving directions, and your your nodes are going to be your intersections, and then the edges are roads connecting those intersections, you don't want to just know that there is an edge connecting two nodes. What you want is for each edge to have some weight, which is the time it takes to travel from one intersection to another if you take that road. Then we can find our driving directions and minimize our time to get from point A to point B. With breadth first search, we can do pathfinding like this, but it's only going to minimize the number of edges. 
It's not going to minimize based on any other criteria, just the number of edges. So if you wanted to use this for driving directions, it's just going to say the number of intersections it takes to get from point A to point B, which, uh, which is probably going to choose the throughway more often than not, because you can go long stretches and fewer intersections. It's going to choose that, which will probably be the right answer in a lot of cases. But if there's some back road way to take that has quite a few intersections, this ain't going to find it. For that, we need different algorithms. We need weighted edges and uh, different algorithms. It would be Dijkstra's at that point. Uh, or A star, as uh, some people like to mention a lot, is uh, um, uh, there's somebody in the previous lecture who mentions A star each time, and they, they have implemented A star. It's really cool. But uh, uh, Dijkstra's or A star to be able to find the shortest path in a weighted graph, which is a whole different beast. But this will find the shortest path in terms of number of edges. We're not doing it this semester. Maybe it'll come back sometime. But uh, the, we used to do pathfinding on the homework, and the homework was quite a bit more involved. We also gave more starting code, too, to try to balance that out. But uh, you know, changes in the course. But this is what they, they used to have. They would build something. Um, they would be given this code. And then they'd have to do pathfinding, where this is a game that we can play, where you're the player character, this yellow circle, and the AI characters would find the closest player and then hunt them down using pathfinding um, to compute the path to take and then actually traverse that path as well. So their task was, if they're this AI, uh, we're going to see this as human players, but this AI is going to see this graph. They're going to be at this node. The player's going to be at this node. And then they have to run breath first search on this node, find the shortest path, to, my eyes keep bugging out, I think it's this node. Uh, from this node to this node, actually compute the path, the shortest path to get there while avoiding walls, because those walls, as you can see, just won't have nodes associated with them. And then traverse that path to hunt down the player. Uh, so that's what we would do. We see this stuff, but the AI just sees the graph. It knows, it computes which node it's currently on, which node the target player is on, and then hunts them down by running breath first search, reconstructing the path by going backwards, and then building the path in this 2D space as a sequence of grid locations, and then traversing the path. It was super fun, but it, it's a lot of work at the same time. Just a trade off there. Uh, we're doing actors. So how do we find degrees of separation between actors? And I'll probably revisit this at the beginning of Friday's lecture, just to make sure we talk about test nine stuff some more. 